this session we're going to talk about perseverance. Today there are all sorts of pressures on people to give in to the demands of a fast-changing world. Satan, with all his subtle and wily ways, is doing his utmost to cause people to lose the direction of their faith. He tries to do this in a variety and a number of different uh, ways and some of those ways uh, we'll look at right now. Firstly, by putting pressure on people to attain success at any cost. Secondly, he tries and uh, initiates people into a place where they compromise their faith and their goals and their vision. Thirdly, uh, he sees you and produces circumstances that pressurize you with worries, doubts, anxieties and fears about your future. Another way that he uses is putting you in such a place that you get your eyes off the Lord and onto other people by gossip, etc. Sometimes he, he works through discontent and hence uh, perhaps depression or feelings of a lack of accomplishment. Another way he works is through peer pressures and he works through temptations as well. These are just some of the things that are thrown at us today to try and break our onward journey, our journey with the living God. So any one of a number of these things may cause a person to buckle under the strain and run from God and turn their back, sometimes on Him completely. Many Christians experience difficulties maintaining their faith and persevering with God. You know, today's world is so much built on glitter and razzmatazz and the euphoria of perpetual highs of running to and fro, as Daniel stated in the last days that the world would be like. And in that kind of scenario, it's easier to get caught up in the busyness of life, looking for the next fix of excitement new experiences, the challenge of the unknown and the unexpected, so often feed people with the excitement of new horizons. In reality, life is not one big blissful experience. It takes the ups and downs of life to mature us in our Christian walk. So in perseverance, firstly, I want to address uh, God's constancy in our constantly changing world, the Lord gives us this comfort. Comfort In Malachi 3 and verse 6, he says, I am the Lord, I change not. What tremendous confidence we can put in him. He doesn't change and he'll always be there. In Hebrews 13, 5, he says, I will never leave you or forsake you. God's unshakable. He'll always be there. He's never in a flap, depressed, or gone on holidays. He is totally and absolutely reliable. He won't criticize you or leave you. Your friends might, but God is committed. He's committed to you. He'll never break any promise that he has made to you. Why? Because Hebrews 6.18 tells us it's impossible for God to lie. Now, how do you react when things are going badly for you? Do you blame God? Do you blame your wife, your friends, your pastors? Or do you just get depressed totally and blame them all? Maybe even kicking the dog because somehow he's got a figure in that also. You know, the mark of your spiritual maturity is how you react to pressure. Do you cave in at the sides? Or do you allow it to mould your character and work for you? Romans 8, 28. Here's a scripture many of you will know. All things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. God's constancy is a reflection of the way we should be when in the midst of the most horrendous trials, whether it's a faith, persecution or bodily affliction, in such times, we need to know. James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, 
and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. You see, pressures and persecutions are often the results of doing something good for God. And to that purpose, I'm going to read Nehemiah 4, verses 1 to 11. But it so happened that Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, that he was furious and very indignant and mocked the Jews. And he spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer them sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish, stones that are burned? Now Tobiah, the Ammonite, was beside him, and he said, Whatever they build, if even a fox goes up on it, it will break down their stone wall. Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn the reproach on their own heads and give them as plunder to the land of captivity. Do not cover their iniquity and do not let their sins be blotted out from before you, for they have provoked you to anger before the builders. So we built the wall and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height for the people had a mind to work. Now it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and the gaps were beginning to be closed, that they became very angry. And all of them conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. Nevertheless, we made our prayer to our God and because of them, we set a watch against them day and night. Then Judah said, The strength of the labourers is failing, and there is so much rubbish that we're not able to build the wall. All our adversaries said, They will neither know nor see anything till we come into their midst and kill them and cause the work to cease. Here they were. They were doing a good work for God. The background to this chapter is that Nehemiah was the cupbearer of King Artaxerxes, who was the stepson of Queen Esther. When he heard about the conditions of Jerusalem, he determined to go back to his homeland and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. To do this, he led the third and last return to Jerusalem from the time of the Babylonian exile. Upon his return, he challenged his countrymen to rebuild the walls. Chapter 4 of Nehemiah records for us the abuse and opposition he received in doing this task. Jerusalem was a city. Jerusalem, you know, is also our city. Remember Hebrews 12, 22? But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. Possessing the city and building the walls of salvation costs in perseverance, trials and afflictions. So what kinds of opposition here did Nehemiah have to face? Well, firstly, they were, their character was ridiculed. In Nehemiah 4 verse 2, what are these feeble Jews doing? Often in Christian service, we feel like we're feeble and the opposing forces call us feeble and call into question the very things we're doing. But are we feeble? No, we're strong. In 1 Corinthians 1.25, the weakness of God is stronger than man. In 1 John 5.4, Whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Another thing we see they did is they ridiculed their object objectives. In Hebrews 4.2, will they fortify themselves? People might say, hey, look what you're doing. Heaven doesn't exist. What a waste of time and effort going to church. What good can it possibly do? What can Christ do for you? The world says he's dead after all. The world tries every way 
to undermine our long-term goals, whether they be spiritual or physical. We can take encouragement from what the Lord said. And he was talking uh, to Mary here, and he says, he says this in Luke 10, verse 42. But one thing is, near, is needed, and Mary has chosen that good path, which will not be taken away from her. In fact, he was talking to Martha there about Mary. In Matthew 24, 13, he says this, He endures, he who endures to the end shall be saved. Another thing that uh, they had come against them, these builders of the walls, was that they were ridiculed for the way they worshipped. And you know, often you'll be ridiculed as well. In Nehemiah 4, 2, Will they offer sacrifices? You see, one of, greatest, one of Satan's greatest ploys is to come against the way you worship. He will accuse you through others. E.g., it's wrong to worship in that fashion, to pray in tongues, to worship in the Spirit. And he'll always have a heap of books written by ill-informed skeptics on the subject who believe that the things of the Spirit were only for yesterday to get the church started. Well-meaning friends will try and put you back on the track or rather see you not go to church at all rather than go to that church. The restoration of Jerusalem and of its people involved ridicule of their worship. So you can be expected that the form of worship it will be ridiculed by others as well. Another thing that challenged their perseverance was that their enthusiasm was ridiculed. In Nehemiah 4.2, will they complete it in a day? The enthusiasm of the group who under Nehemiah were rebuilding the walls was infectious. It was good, hard work and challenging. The people had a goal and that goal was firing them up to do the work. The work had to be done, and they were working at it with all their might. They had a vision. And in Nehemiah 2.18, that vision was to let us rise up and build. Have you ever had good, well-meaning people throw water upon your enthusiasm for God? If it's God's directed in line with God's word, don't let them do it. Persevere, push ahead. The Lord said to Simon and the disciples in Luke 22, 31, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. How good is that? And I believe the Lord, seated at the right hand, is still praying for every one of us today who name the name of Jesus. They were ridiculed also uh, in the lasting nature of what they were doing. In Nehemiah 4, 3, what did they say? Whatever they build, if even a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. Well, that was some sort of a ridicule, wasn't it? People would tell you, oh, look, it's just a fadism. You know, it's temporary insanity. You'll come to your senses soon. This religious thing won't last long. What you're doing is just a passing phase. And I think some of us have heard those sorts of remarks at different times of our Christian faith. This is but another trial the Christian has to pass through from the assaults of Satan through those he uses against you. If we listen to it enough, we begin to find justification for our behaviour and not continuing the work that God has called us to. But note what Paul the Apostle said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labour is not in vain in the Lord. How good is that? Our labour is not in vain in the Lord. You know, we need to persevere in the face of discouragement from within as well as without. 
In Nehemiah 4 verses 7 to 11, we read how there was one last effort against the rebuilding. Verse 8, it says, All of them conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. You know, the enemy does not give up easily. He'll throw everything at you. And when this fails, he'll even cause discouragement to come from within the camp. We note that verse 10, Judah said, The strength of the laborers is failing and there is so much rubbish that we're not able to build the wall. So much rubbish, so much stuff in the way, we're not able to build this wall. You see, it's bad enough when we receive discouragement from those who don't name Christ, yet alone when we receive it from those who do name Christ. Discouragement from within the camp can take many different forms. It can come in the form of gossip and false accusation, come in the form of misunderstanding or of unwarranted criticism. It can also take the form of a lack of love and acceptance. And of course, scorn and ridicule as well may cause discouragement. Although these things shouldn't happen, sometimes they do, and then the heat of the struggle and the battle we are in increases immensely. You see, we expect persecution from without, but persecution from within, discouragement from within, uh, we do not expect that. The writer to the Hebrews said, we are a part of Christ's house. If we, in Hebrews 3, verses 6 and 14, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope, firm unto the end, for we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Let no man move us from that confidence. So what then carried Nehemiah's workers through? What then will carry you on, carry you forward in your perseverance? The first thing we see is dedication. In Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 6, we read the people had a mind to work. They had a mind to do the job that was ahead of them. You see, there needs to be a, a dedication to the purpose of God if we are to persevere in our faith and not stumble on the way. Many people fall because there is not the dedication and commitment to His purposes in their lives. They're afraid that God will require too much of them if they get too involved or that he will ask them to give up too much. Things which as yet they are unprepared to surrender for the kingdom's sake. So dedication is important. Another thing that is important is prayer. We read in Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 9, We made our prayer unto God. The Bible calls us as workers for him to always have a praying heart. In Ephesians 4, sorry, in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 18, it says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end, that all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. In the times of trial and affliction, we will pray. But let's not leave prayer until circumstances force us to our knees. Let us persevere by praying in the Spirit as Paul encourages us to do. Another thing that we need to persevere is alertness. In Nehemiah 4.9 we read this, we set a watch against them day and night. Watching is often linked with prayer in the scriptures. I believe we'll never pray effectively unless we're alert to what is happening around us. In 1 Peter 4, 7, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore be serious and watchful in your prayer. You know, I've just said something here. 
um, relating to the alertness of what is happening around us. And uh, I read an article once where Ruth Graham, um, the wife of Billy Graham, was asked, uh, you know, how, how does she know what things to pray for? And she says, well, daily, you know, I look at the newspaper, I see what is happening around us, and I see that there are things happening in this world that need to be prayed for, and I use that to govern my prayer. You know, we need to be alert to the things that are really going on around us, whether it's in our church life, whether it's in our personal lives, and we, we need to adopt uh, those principles, I believe. Also, what helps us in our perseverance is having a word from God. And uh, in Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 12 and 18, it says this, I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. How good is that? And our word of God coming to Nehemiah, the king also, you know, giving him leave of absence to come back to Jerusalem and to rebuild the walls. And having that word, we need to persevere in the things that God has had us to, and has called us to do. Nehemiah knew what God had impressed upon his heart. He had a word from God. We today need to take God at his word if we're to endure temptation and trials and be overcomers in this world. You see, even having the Word of God, we need to look how it is that God's Word does encourage us. And I want to leave with you three passages of Scripture concerning these. In Romans 8, 37 and 39, it says, Yet in all these things we're more than conquerors. In actual fact, uh, in, in the Greek text here, it's, it's like we're super victorious. We've translated it more than conquerors because you, once you're victorious, you can't be, have a greater victory than the victory you've received. But the, the Greek text here makes it very clear that we are more than a conqueror through him who loved us. And Paul goes on, he said, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. How good is that? In 2 Timothy 4.18, it tells us that the Lord will deliver us from every evil work and preserve us for his kingdom. I've put it into the plural, but it, you need to understand he will deliver us from every evil work. So continue what God has given you to continue with. In John 10, verses 28 and 29, he says, And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. And then in Psalm 37, Verses 24 and 28. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholds him with his hand. For the Lord loves justice and does not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever. So in the light of those scriptures, in the light of the example that we've seen in Nehemiah's life there from chapter 4, and the words of God and the agreement to that word by even a heathen king himself, we need to understand that we need to pursue and complete the various things that God gives us to do. And in order to do those things, perseverance is an essential aspect of our Christian walk. 
So I encourage you, no matter what you're confronting this day, to persevere in the things of God. So God bless you, and I hope you find this session helpful.